Plants. They purify air, filter water, provide food and shelter. Plants brighten up our spaces and our moods as well. Most importantly, plants do the absolutely necessary job of regulating the environment, which make them indispensable to life. Being out there in, in the hot sun, working very hard in the garden, actually that really energizes me. So to most people, they might think it's laborious or dirty. Actually, I love being around in the dirt. I love being around nature and, and I become a whole new different person. Oh, wow! Oh. Oh. No, 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 see, see, see the album. So ironically, even though I've been an urban farmer, growing a lot of edible plants, I know absolutely nothing about ornamental plants. Uh, I've always been in a journey of converting existing ornamental spaces into edible spaces. So I even felt sometimes that growing ornamental plants or house plants are not productive or not functional. And so maybe it's that mindset that caused me to block out the interest or the desire to learn more about house plants. Papa, your orchids are very, very nice. When you water, you water the roots. Try not to water the plants. So normally I water twice a day. Twice a day? Morning and then uh, afternoon. Okay, so what else do you do, you do to the plants? What are this, all these white colour patches? Insecticide. Insecticide? Yeah. Why do you spray insecticide? If you don't, the leaves may be attacked. So on a regular basis, you try to Spray insecticide. Yeah, so over here, all the flowers are blooming so much, but then over here, there's no flowers at all. No, no, it's coming, it's coming. Over time. Oh, it's just going to give it <laughs> yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put fertilizer over time, it will. My philosophy in farming or in gardening is allowing nature to do its thing. And uh, often, the case is to be able to build up the conditions for an uh, ecosystem to be created, and then the different parts of the ecosystem can work together. That allows me the farmer, to kick back and wait for the harvest. Without biodiversity, potted houseplants seem to require a lot more care and attention. Hey, hi, Auntie Zer. Hey, hi. Yeah. Wow, your garden is so beautiful. Uh, thank you I so much. I love the flowers here. It's so pretty. My roses, you see? Oh, now started roses. blooming, yeah. Yeah, they're yeah. so lovely. Yeah, the yellow ones, the pink one, all the roses coming out already. Wow. I'm so happy. Okay, this is the double petal hibiscus. Yeah, no. That's very pretty. Yeah. And I have jasmine. Yeah, you can uh, smell, try. Okay. Wow, it, it smells like soap. Yeah. Mm, very nice. <laughs> so when you open your gate, uh, and at night when you just uh, look on your flowers and then you get the nice sensation uh, from this uh, so, jasmine. So the whole place will smell like jasmine yes. at night? Yeah, very nice. Okay. So it's not easy like, I actually have to really take care like. yeah. because I talk to my plants. So. You talk to yeah. <laughs> I talk to my plants. What do you, what do you tell them? I, tell them so, I say good morning to them, <laughs> you know, and then uh, please bloom me beautiful flowers or that. Like. Wow, yeah. and it's really working. Yeah. <laughs> That's so yeah. Part of the joy of keeping house plants is the process of tending to them. Yeah. So despite the challenges, house plants have enjoyed much popularity in recent years. Mm. The trend is easy to spot even in my neighbourhood. Like, yeah, aloe vera. This uh, neighbourhood in Serangoon North is amazing because it seems that every homeowner here has green thumbs. So if, if you just walk around, you'll find that every home would have their own charm and personality. Growing plants has always been a part of my life. The thing is, they were always just food to me. So now, I want to explore the other side of this growing trend. What is the purpose of growing plants if they can't be consumed? I think I'm going through a transition in my mindset as an urban farmer, and I'm actually very excited to embark on this journey to really understand about house plants and also understand the technicalities behind this world of uh, ornamental plants. My farming background has shaped my style of growing. 
The interdependence of plants, environment, and living organisms allow me to take a hands-off approach to farming. So I'm looking for a plant trend that's low maintenance, something that would require as little intervention as possible. Hi, Leo. Hey, hi, Chris. Hi. Oh, what a beautiful place you have. So relaxing and I really like the vibes in here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. As I'm stepping into Three Keys, it feels like I'm coming home to a very, very cosy home. Wow. Such a beautiful display. Yeah, no, yeah. No. Three Keys is completely different to any of the plant nurseries that I've ever been to. The integration of all the plants into what appears to be a living room space completely breaks out of the common mould of how a nursery looks and feels like. It's so pretty. And actually, some of these plants are very familiar. I've seen them at some cafes before. So we have a bonsai until a very small mini codex plant, like this one. This one we grow from here, we grow out by cell, and then uh, pairing with a local pot. Yeah, quite easy to take care, and this is my best seller. Yeah, I thought the mini bonsai will be more interesting to Singaporean because it's this small, mini and cute, and uh, seen our space quite limited. So this mini size thing, it suits our space. We don't need a big bonsai to put at house, but we can have a small mini bonsai to put uh, in our small space. Liu started his business with a few particular types of consumers in mind. The busy Singaporean with limited space at home, the novice plant lover, and the plant killer. So I started to really, really educate the customer and how to water, how to fertilize, how to take note on these uh, insects and bugs. I really, really helped them, but somehow they die. <laughs> so it's a living thing. I know this is very difficult for them, but uh, I'm still doing this education part for, uh, so that they can, one day they can learn. Liu gradually built a name for himself as the curator of bonsai and miniature plants. What makes him stand out is his eye for the aesthetic. When some customer come to me, they say, uh, we want to get a plant, so I strongly recommend a fast tree because usually they want to grow indoor and put it nicely at the living space. So uh, I will firstly will just recommend this ever fast tree like, because it's easy to take care. All plants need light which makes growing them indoors a little tricky. After figuring out how much light the space gets, plants that require bright direct light go right next to the window, and low-maintenance plants that usually require less light can be placed further inside the room. So usually people ask, oh, uh, what part suitable for this one? So uh, I will asking them, what design you like and what, what is your house uh, theme, minimalist or what? So they say we like to have a clean, clean thing, you know, uh, simple. So usually I will just uh, recommend the stone pot, lah, very minimalist. The pot is very important to the plant because it can bring the whole feeling out, can present the shape of the plant. Imagine if, let's say, you just get the plant and then you put in a plastic pot and it won't make the plant standing up with a design pot and it will make the plant more elegant, gorgeous and beautiful. Just put in a pot and then you just add soil. So, okay, fill up the soil and then you, and then I will decorate the surface with a stone or moss. Yeah, maybe you can help. Okay. Yeah. So you can just put pebble stone to, to fill out the space, to cover the soil, then it will look clean. Yeah. Liu has this amazing ability to transform a mere plant into something much, much more beautiful than I would have ever imagined. He uses different elements like pots to completely transform the look and feel of a plant. You know, he can take an average plant and create a certain emotion or a certain uh, vibe to that plant. You can get the feeling, huh? yeah. the bonsai feeling. So it totally look different already, you see? Yes. Yeah, so that's many all. Okay, emotions you, or yes. feelings you bring up yeah. and you put it in different pots. Correct, correct, correct. Many people do like to see something that looks pretty and beautiful. Is this all part of our human nature? And moulding the plant in this way and shaping them is an easy way to create this beauty in our lives. And I think what Leo did today was he helped me understand how relevant it can be in bringing joy and beauty into our daily lives. Yeah, I know you're a big plant lover. So why is plant so important to you and your life? 
plant is a part of uh, a part of us, part of nature. We are also part of nature. From my experience, I think these uh, plant right, they are very therapeutic. So when they see the new leaf or new shoot or flower, so people very happy. I've come to realize that in the world of house plants, pots are almost as important as the plants themselves. A concept that's rather foreign to me, the farmer. But for one entrepreneur, the love of both nature and pots led to the development of a product that's changing mindsets. One candle at a time. A trip to the Great Barrier Reef started it all. I was snorkeling and the corals and the wildlife and the ocean was just beautiful. We saw like octopus, you know, reef sharks, um, I swam with turtles and that was when I was like, wow, I really want to bring my niece to Great Barrier Reef. And at that point, like I was thinking, oh wait, she's four now, so by the time that she can snorkel and go with me, that'll be like 12 years later. And I thought, what if like the corals are no longer like so vibrant and beautiful and you don't get to see all this marine life? And then I was like, oh man, we really need to start, you know, to do something about it. The result was a candle with a scent reminiscent of the Great Barrier Reef. And Pass It On was born with the desire to promote eco-consciousness through candles. It has since expanded its range to include other destinations that have been affected by climate change. But these are not just candles, they are also planters. Made of porous concrete, these pots allow air and water to pass through their walls, perfect for maintaining the moisture conditions when growing plants. The whole planting part is really to give opportunity for people to experience gardening in a, in a very direct and simple manner. Everything I need to start growing houseplants is right here. There are papers with seeds embedded. I'm guessing you're growing what, um, plants that would survive for a long time, right? Yeah, yeah so... Like, like perennials. Yes, yeah. I mean, they're quite easy to grow. So we have black eye Susans, sesame and also basil. So this inside here is actually three soil pellets a growing medium that retains water and remains airy at the same time. So it's peat, right? It's all made of organic matter. It has a bit of coconut husk inside. So actually the instructions is to put um, three tablespoons of water inside. Yeah. Once it soaks up the water, then the, the soil would expand out. So I used um, something similar in, in growing microgreens. Oh, okay. Yeah, I used uh, coconut fibre. Oh, okay, I think that's loose enough. And then um, you can take the seed paper. So usually we recommend just half of it because there's actually quite a lot of seeds inside. Mm -hmm. So you can shred it. You can tear into smaller pieces. Put it in. Yeah. yeah. So the paper is biodegradable. You can yeah. see that it's also very fibrous. So I will now yeah. saturate water. it. Okay. Correct. You can see that um, it's moist and damp. Um, which is great. So like we want to keep it this way for like a week. Then in two to three weeks, you'll have your sprouts. Nice. Yep. Pass It On's goal is simple. To raise climate change awareness and at the same time, encourage consumers to develop a love for nature through growing. Michelle definitely leads by example. I'll introduce some of my house plants to you. Uh, it's a very modest collection, but I think we have quite a good variety here. Um, so if you start from this corner, it's um, Portos. It actually vines, so it'll be good to have a stick at some point. Then it can grow um, on the stick. Then we also have Begonias. So these are very cute because like, if you look closely, it actually has a webbing. So it's actually very fibrous on top. And then we have like this um, Alocasia. 
they require a lot of attention uh, and humidity uh, requirements. So we have this thermometer here that tells the temperature and also the humidity. I would say like the next easy but yet exotic plant that I would recommend to people is always the philodendron. They, they love light and the watering is actually very simple. You just make sure like you have a, a moss pole for it to climb on and the moss pole is always moist. It's actually quite low maintenance. So I would totally recommend this. Maybe I can give you a cutting at some point. <laughs> for me, houseplants yeah. allows me to really slow down and appreciate the natural rhythm of the environment, right? Um, I go by this quote quite a bit, which is grow with the flow. It really teaches you patience. Right? It really teaches you to appreciate the little things in life. But also like physically or more tactilely, the colour green is just my favourite. Mm. Yeah, that's why like our candles are also green. <laughs> like many plant enthusiasts, Michelle is constantly trying to switch up the look of her indoor garden. There's always new plants to add to the collection, new pots to jazz up the space with, or new systems to enhance the growing environment. So you know this um, pink princess, right? I actually do have like um, a situation where the roots are growing out of the moss pole and I'm just thinking like to change it out to a taller moss pole. Yeah, I'm just thinking if there can be like a, maybe a creative way to also utilize this space, right? And we can put all the fillos together, maybe? Yeah. I may be new to houseplants, but my experience in building and designing indoor gardens can definitely be put to good use here. You have this beautiful uh, tall space, and if we can utilize the vertical space completely, that will give them a very nice uh, visual impact because uh, as they grow tall, that whole wall of green will be very therapeutic and very impactful. So looking at her white wall, I really can envision creating some form of structure like a trellis or a, a frame that would allow the climbing plants to grow much more productively and to take up all that vertical space in that garden. I can definitely think about using my knowledge in climbing edible plants to fit the ornamental plants into uh, her space, into her balcony. To get more ideas for Michelle's indoor vertical garden, I'm visiting the cutting garden of a botanical studio known for its quirky plant installations. If there's anyone who's pushing the boundaries of design with horticulture, it has got to be John and his team. Today, I'm getting a peek behind the scenes of the typical design process. So for right now, what, what are we looking out for? I think we, we, we're trying to get about this length of stem and then a mixture of flowers and beans okay. at the same time. It's like this is pretty okay and mature. Are you going to be using some of these? Yeah, we're going to use it later. Uh, and I'm Solomon here. We do a weekly arrangements there. Wow. That's cute. That's really cute. I think part of uh, living in the tropics is that things grow kind of wild, e exactly. rampant, fetid, kind of feverish. And I think we really wanted to reflect the kind of energy and the work that we do. Yeah. So Chris, we're actually um, going to cut some of this cacti. Pencil, it's um, Euphorbia tirucali, or pencil cactus. Well, because it looks like a pencil, right? Um, and the shoots are very yellowish. Um, and we actually use a lot of cacti and succulents and arrangements because they last very long. Mm. Uh, you have to wash your hands afterwards. I'm very drawn to wildness. Very clearly, nature doesn't have to apologize for herself. A lot of bush plants are very hardy. Yeah. So this will last in water for like almost two weeks. Wow. Yeah. It's really important for us to understand um, naturalism and how things appear naturally. Not that we, we, we understand it so that we can mimic it, but sometimes we understand it so we can actually subvert it and create something that looks a little bit unexpected. And just when I thought the plants in this garden are nothing like whatever I've seen before, the real magic happens when John assembles the cuttings he's harvested. This looks particularly good here because it looks like a piece of sculpture in itself. We're going to do something quite special today. Uh, when I cut the leaves off of the papaya, you can see that they're actually like, it's hollow inside. Yeah. And we're going to actually put um, amaranth um, coming out of this so it looks like a fountain. Wow. And so what I'm doing now is just cutting the, the tube so that they just stick out a little bit less. We love using amaranth because it has this kind of a drapey quality and it looks like tassels. And so if you look at this over here, um, we kind of want to like position it in space. So we kind of imagine it coming out from uh, one of these sockets, I would say. Don't hesitate, just, just <laughs> stuff it in. The way I work with plants is very straightforward. I usually just harvest them, put them in a box and send them away. 
So this time I really had to like, slow down and see whether I could add some value by adjusting the positions of some of the plants are and try to make it look attractive. I never really used this side of my brain before, this like creative side of my, my brain. So it's very, very enjoyable. It's really, really three-dimensional. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Right? yeah. I really, really liked the, the end product. It was exactly what John set out in his mind. And also the way he used the plants of different varieties but having the same hues, like that green and that slight orange blush. That was really, really nice in a way. It somehow all came together that I could have never envisioned it when I first started with the arrangement. So it was, it was just very, very unexpected but inspiring moment. And I'm just going to tuck it in. Watching John work, the process seems so organic it almost comes across as effortless. While his designs find their place in classy, fashionable settings, the origins are often less glamorous. This is one of my favourite places to come to because um, the unique topography of this piece of land uh, allows water to kind of pool exactly where we're standing. We're in a bit of a drought season right now, that's why there's not much water around. Oh, so it's, it's big or it's, it's huge. It's, it's humongous. You actually have to go out to nature to observe how um, these things behave in the wild. Um, and then, hopefully by um, incorporating elements of naturalism in an arrangement, it somehow feels right or more natural. And I've stopped here to introduce giant alocasia. This is just really stunning and amazing and majestic. Look, look, look at the thickness of each stem. Oh, yeah. and crazy. It doesn't even grow so big in the, in the forest. Yeah, I think this is a very specific um, cultivar of uh, alocasia that um, grows really well um, in, in wetland situations. Yeah. Uh, I think part of our interest as a botanical design studio really is like not, it, it's not just like in floral arrangements, but we're interested in the aesthetic pleasure that uh, plants and flowers give us. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I really like going to like corners of nurseries and finding stuff that's like kind of interesting. And you never know what you might find. The question I get a lot is, um, where do you get your inspiration? And the truth is like, it comes from anywhere. For example, I look at a rain tree, uh, I said, oh wow, that's amazing. And someone else looks at it and they're like, nothing new. And I'm like, oh, but look, look at the epiphytes growing on it. It looks like they're living communities on it. Um, look at uh, the kind of density of bird's nest ferns that are growing on it. Uh, you see a scene where it's just um, so dramatic or so overgrown or so wild or so fierce that I feel something. Um, I think the English describe it as like um, the feeling of the sublime. And that is, for me, a bit of a holy grail in terms of just like trying to recreate that in the work that we do. For a little bit of contrast, texturally, I think I'm going to use... John has opened my eyes to the endless design possibilities that plants offer. But more importantly, he's shown me that there is so much beauty in the wild, unadulterated and often underrated. This is just really stunning and amazing and majestic. To challenge myself to find beauty in unexpected places, I've arranged for a spot of forest bathing with my new friend, Michelle. Yeah, so I really like how like they're also kind of growing 
wild and naturally here. I think they get really good like moisture and light. Um, and it's not direct light because you have all these filtered light from the taller trees. Oh, that's a very iconic Candles may be what Michelle sells, but at the heart of her business is a love for nature. So a few months ago, as part of the annual Earth Day celebrations, Michelle conducted nature tours around Singapore. It's a conscious tour that uh, I created to encourage people to come out and be closer to nature and feel like um, closer to biodiversity and get a sense of calmness and consciousness. I love how off the beaten track the experience in Clementi Forest is. Uh, isn't as, as uh, easy to manoeuvre or, or track through as other forested areas. You know, for example, we had to cross a little stream and it was slippery, it was muddy. There were, there were a lot of foliage and we had to bash through them. And also there were logs that had fallen. This is one of Singapore's last unprotected forests. Once a railway track, it's now overgrown with vegetation. After some time, you can see that nature has come back and has taken over and it does it so quickly and I think nature just has this certain character of being resilient. It will always find a way to thrive no matter what conditions there are. It will find a way to adapt and survive and outcompete everything else. charming about this leaf. Mm. You feel like nature is, is working its magic on this. Well, these giant taros, they are like just suddenly flourishing here. Mm -hmm. I think because like they get quite nice direct sunlight. So actually you can take a lot of like references and notes from Mother Nature to see how like they can best grow. I really feel like I've transported to another country, another part of the world. Yeah, and you never expect that um, in Singapore, right? Yeah. Like to find these pockets of spaces. And as we went deeper into the forest, the, the climate changed. And you can feel like the temperature is a lot cooler here, right? It, it does feel like a bit like AC almost. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. very comfortable. Yeah. yeah. And actually the humidity is, is much higher, but you don't feel so, because it's much cooler, you don't feel so like icky like outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think like even these, um, Different Bakya, the common name Damkane, like they're growing so much better here than outside. Mm. Is it a house plant? I, it does look very familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It makes for, for very nice house plants because like if you look at the stem, it has like all these like spots. Yeah. It's actually quite decorative. Yeah, Michelle, this looks very familiar. This is probably one of the only few ornamental or house plants I know about. <laughs> is this called a money plant? Yeah, it is, yeah. And in fact, this is quite nice because it's like climbing up on the tree. And those leaves are huge. I've never mm. seen them at that size before. Yeah, because it's in its natural environment, yeah. so it's thriving. So what I really enjoyed about the hike was having this newfound knowledge that allowed me to see things in a different light. Being able to experience the wilderness and feeling all that sensations on your skin, all that sights and sounds, that is very stimulating for both the mind and the body. And that's why I think the wilderness is so beautiful and it's so special to me. Seeing houseplants in the forest has piqued my curiosity. So I continue my journey in search of something extremely low maintenance. Because my lifestyle is very, very hectic, I am often not at home a lot. So it does mean that I wouldn't have enough time to spend on watering, managing pests, or providing fertilizer to the plants. There is someone who can help me. He's the avatar. Hey, hi, Chris. Hi. Morning. Morning. Wow, oh, this is amazing. The whole stretch belongs to you. Yes, all these are my air plants. Wow. The scientific name for air plants are called Tillensius. Okay. And they are actually endemic to uh, South and Central America. Fascinated by their unique shape and texture, Daniel fell in love with air plants about seven years ago. Avatar is his air plants only nursery. But it all started here, along his corridor. So Chris, the amazing thing about air plants is um, they do not absorb nutrients and moisture with their roots, but rather it's through the air. And therefore, the moisture that they absorb right, is through this cell called the trichomes. 
And these trichomes are the cells that make them look sort of frosty and also very greyish looking. Before today, the only thing I knew about air plants were they looked a bit foreign and alien to me. And I know people always talk about it as being very low maintenance plants. Without the need for soil, air plants make for an easy and clean option for people who live in smaller spaces. All you need for air plants right, is bright filtered lights, for number one. Secondly, is the um, misting, regular misting. And thirdly, of course, you need a lot of these uh, good air ventilations. Therefore, the best place to grow air plants are corridors, or balconies, or just hang beside your windows. A lot of people think that actually we are taking care of the plants, but actually I would think that you know, in turn, actually they take care of us as well. Air plants, I find that they are especially therapeutic because you hang them, you actually hang them um, like eye level or even higher. So while the wind sways the plant, right, you can sort of feel that rhythmic kind of uh, uh, sort of flow, and therefore just by looking at them, actually you feel very calm as well. I feel like I feel like <laughs> petting them, you know, like yeah. you do that. Yeah, yeah. sometimes I do. As Daniel's air plant collection grew, so did his desire to share his passion with others. So he created a space to showcase his treasures. Wow, Daniel, this space is amazing. Thank you, thank you. Welcome to Avata. Oh, I really feel like I'm in a rainforest. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and this also feels like a Zen garden. Yes. I feel also um, at peace now. Part nursery, part century. He wants to inspire others to grow these low-maintenance plants by enjoying the beauty here in this space. The moment they step into Avatar, right, they are like, you know, movies, Avatar, right? Out of this world, totally new landscape, new planet even. As it turns out, there is so much to explore in this world of air plants. There are a total of roughly 3,500 species recorded. And this small space alone, houses 300 of them. So in this area, right, typically you can see all the gigantic sized air plants, oh, yeah. right? And they have very lovely uh, long leaves. Yeah. So sometimes, right, I'll just kind of like stroke them, you know, as if they are like hairs of a woman, you know, whereby, you know, they are very, very good to touch. Go on, I mean, just feel it, isn't it? I wish, <laughs> I wish I had hair like that <laughs> someday. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let me show you my most precious plant in this avatar. Okay. And it's right up there. And this is my most precious plant. It's, the hybrid name is called Eric Nublok. A hybrid is a cross-pollination of two air plants to form a new species. Enthusiasts usually breed to create unique characteristics like colours and patterns, also known as variegation in plant speak. And why is it make this plant so special is because the plant is actually a variegated um, mutation that has these stripes yeah. along the leaves. And then, you know, the stripes are very, very prominent, especially after you mist it, right? The variation is even more clearer. Hang them on the ceiling, display them on mini rocks, or let them drip like a curtain. These air plants look good from every angle. Daniel even assembles them into art displays. So I have this very small artisanal piece of display here. What I'd like you to do now is to transform this look of that um, air plant display onto this piece of big wood here. Okay. In order for us to mount the air plants onto the wood, you'll need this uh, industrial uh, strength glue. And then you just apply a little bit. So what you're going to do is you're going to turn it over and you're going to place it firmly mm -hmm. and give it a little bit of pressure. You know, usually when I grow plants, it is very process-driven. I, I just want to grow it as fast as I can to let the plant grow as big as it can very quickly. So this time, it forced me to slow down. It forced me to look at the plant carefully, touch it, feel it, appreciate it. So this is a very delicate job now, huh? Yeah. <laughs> and it was a very nice experience having to, to do that. This type of uh, mushroom it has this very fairy tale feel mm. to make this um, display even more interesting. Daniel's approach was very different because he came in from an angle of an artist. Ultimately, he's trying to tell stories through his craft. And I really respect that. So Chris, congratulations. You have completed your first air plant display. Love it, love it. Thank you so much for teaching me.
Okay, mommy, I know you like plastic flowers, but then I don't really like them. I think they are not alive, so there's something missing in the house. Too bad. <laughs> I don't like ants all over the house. My mom actually really likes flowers. Basically, she's very practical and she thinks that it's important to not create a mess or have plants that are very low maintenance. So I actually discovered something that doesn't have ants. It's also very low maintenance and it's very pretty uh, yeah. and it's alive. So this is called an air plant and you can see that they all have very different patterns. Like this one is nice and curly. It comes in very different shapes and sizes. So this one um, is a little bit white colour and the more white colour it has, Basically, it means you need to water it less because it's more hardy. This is actually something I made. So it's very cute, very right? Very natural, yeah. yeah all, all I these, like all these little pictures. You know, for the grandchildren, we can put some little things to make them very excited yeah, yeah, about it. Yeah, I think they love it too. It took my parents some time to accept the fact that their son chose to be a farmer. But over the years, gardening has actually brought us closer together. And I feel like gardening in my personal life has helped me to bridge that gap with my own parents as well. For example, with my dad who likes his orchids. There's just a little bit of connection that we have started to gain from uh, the hobby of gardening. I may have gotten my parents started on their gardening journey, but for Brian, it was the other way around. Hi, Lindy. Hi, Brian. Hey, hi. Oh, hey. How are you? Hey, nice to meet you. Wow, what a lovely garden you have here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, there are actually a lot of uh, plants that I recognise. Really? Uh, I see some nice butterflies, sorrel and Cuban oregano. So, who inspired who to start this collection? I think definitely my mom. I, I, she's been taking care of plants since I was a little kid and I remember growing up uh, looking at all her plants. She taught me that most of the plants are quite resilient. They can grow in a lot of kinds of conditions, you know. They don't need any kind of special care and uh, they can grow well. Yeah, so I think that's what I picked up from my mom. It's been coined the botanic boom, an upward trend of young people collecting plants. But the older generation of Singaporeans are the real trendsetters. They've been growing in kampongs and along corridors, way before plant influencers stole the spotlight. Yeah, this is one of my favourite. I call it butterfly, but I think the name is Ox I think it's Oxalis. Oxalis. Yeah. This is, what, what do you like about this? I don't know, it looks like a butterfly, isn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> With the uh, cute little flowers and you no, know, it's just so cheerful. <laughs> I actually grow this in my farm. Uh -huh. uh, it's edible. It actually tastes very, very nice. Oh, really? I never tried. Want to try it? <laughs> uh, the leaves? Yeah, the leaves. Oh. Both the leaves and the flowers are very tasty. Really? Yeah. So I put it in salads because it has a very nice citrusy flavour. Oh, you want to try one? Oh. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Next time you can make salad. No, no, you cannot. <laughs> Some call themselves plant parents, but unlike their predecessors, this new generation of collectors is a little more adventurous, experimental and exotic. So Brian, I saw many plants that are very, very interesting. You know, they have colours or shapes that I've never seen before. I like plants that have interesting forms in the leaves or the stem. And also, because of the limited space in my bedroom, I tend to want to collect kind of unusual, rarer plants, it's a little bit more satisfying. And also like, you know, you only have so much space so you want to save it for the unusual ones. So this cactus actually has uh, little white hairs or fur around the whole plant. And um, some plant uh, botanists, they, they, they think it's because uh, the plant needs protection from the harsh uh, desert sunlight. And so the white um, fuzz actually bounces off some of the light and protects the, the green part the, where the chlorophyll is. And also, the, I have another plant which has white fuzz as well. You can hold this one. So this is an, also another kind of succulent. And it's coated in like a very kind of white fur, I guess. Yeah, I'm quite attracted to unusual forms. So it just looks like a bunch of sticks, but uh, I like that. Yeah. Do you actually do anything to, to maintain them? Or? Yeah. So for the fur, actually, I combed it with a paintbrush to make it look like uh, someone's hair. Yeah. <laughs> so you're trying to make a plant look very human. Yeah, I think Giving them cute. some form of personality. Yeah, exactly. Nice. So here we have some uh, lower light plants. Some of them grow on the forest floor where there isn't too much light so they can tolerate like a low light condition. Like the two of these, these are jewel orchids, which are a kind of orchid but they grow in the ground. Factors like geographical location, demand, rarity, unique shape, colour and variegation can inflate the value of plants, which in turn make them more precious, requiring intricate care. 
Some of the rarer plants or exotic plants are a little bit tricky to keep in the home, but uh, you can do things to try to, to take care of them, like give them more humidity or keep them in a, in a box that, that keeps the, the humidity high. This tub is here to kind of increase the ambient humidity and most of these plants are rainforest plants and this is my currently my prized possession. It's a kind of philodendron. Uh, philodendron serpents. I think the interesting thing is the rambutan like petioles and even on the new shoot as well. So it looks like there's a new leaf coming out soon. I'm quite excited to see what happens. This plant looks very intimidating to me. Yeah. You know, it's like it's giving you a signal, don't touch me. And then the flowers actually looks like uh, some sort of pincer. Yeah. yeah, wow. Native to the tropical rainforest of South America, this rare philodendron costs thousands of dollars. Well, that plant certainly won't be making it to my selection for Michelle's garden makeover project. To help me make wise decisions, I'm here at the nursery with Leo. So the idea is for her to recreate this forest feel. Okay. When you walk in, it's a bit like a green wall, okay. and she can remember the forest. Okay, where is this uh, shell be? The shelf is in her balcony. So, uh, any sunlight coming in from the... Correct, there's a lot of sunlight. So it's full okay. afternoon sun. Okay. Setting up this garden for Michelle had not been easy. I had been stressing out for <laughs> most of the time. So, what about we go the behind, see the alakasia? Okay. Yeah. You know, if you ask me to do an edible plant design, I really have a very, very clear idea of what kind of conditions that the plants require. But for house plants, I was unable to visualize how these plants would look like when they are grown to a more mature stage. We have uh, Alocasia zebrina, like this one with the golden uh, stripes. Mm, yeah. That's very nice. Yeah, that's yeah. very nice and very huge and they love sun. And we can try other philodendron. Uh, this philodendron is quite nice. And in fact, this is a cripple, they can creep. Another one is a fish bone fern. Yeah, easy care also, easy propagate. So you can, have, you can have many, many plants in when yeah. you propagate more. I was so thankful that Leo went to shop with me for those plants because the knowledge that he, he gave me was very, very accurate and it was something that I really, really needed. So are you going to take this one as a, a one of the plants? It looks quite nice. Very nice, yeah. right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. okay, do you need help? Uh, no need, no need. Yeah. I'm good. Hey, Michelle. Hi. So I've got this beautiful creation for you. Yeah. So I really wanted to bring that sense of nature and, and the Clementi Forest wow look into your place. Okay. Well, so Clementi. today we're at Michelle's place. We're going to revamp a part of our balcony. I'm feeling extremely nervous <laughs> because she is an experienced houseplant collector and I'm, I'm just new to this. So I, I hope that I can meet her expectations. What we have here is a drainage element mm -hmm. where when you put the plants both here and hanging, as you water them, Water will flow through these cracks and there's a drainage hole uh, right at the slip over here. Fantastic. So perfectly where your drainage outlet is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it will not create a mess mm. on your flooring. This so, is very smart. Yeah, I really so like this feature. Because I was so inspired by all the people I've met on this journey, I wanted to include a bit of them in this design. So this is a log wood. It's meant for aquariums as well. So okay. it's gonna it's quite hardy. This is basically the centerpiece. Yeah. And the idea is that it reminds you of the sea. So I remember she talked about that trip and the Great Barrier Reef. So I, I put that element in through that log wood to remind her of that journey of how she started. Yeah, so Michelle, I know you have some plants that you really like and I want to include that in this uh, planter. I remember that the excitement that she had in Clementi Forest when she saw the alocasias uh, sticking out from the bottom. So uh, it was essential that I created a very lush understory, something that at one look, you can really feel that it was thriving and it just reminded her of that experience in the forest. Oh, we've got a stack horn fun! Yeah, a stack horn. That's very nice. It's a beauty, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it goes really well with this um, this piece of wood. Mm -hmm. yeah. any, any ideas where this should, should go? Actually, if this can... She did really, really want that wild jungle look in her place. And so I, I did that by creating many levels. It has more of a lush feel, so it really fills up the jungle vibes. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah, nice. Very nice. And then... The main environmental features of her space is, is extremely windy. There's extremely strong morning and afternoon sun. So 
The plants have to be hardy, but they also have to look beautiful at the same time. Got a very exotic looking plant. Wow, I love the purple. <laughs> and these are berries or? Yeah, uh, these are little berries. So this plant is actually edible. Oh wow. This is called the Malabar spinach. Malabar spinach. Yeah, and I love how... So does it taste like spinach? It's, it does taste a bit like spinach. Uh, it's also called emperor vegetable. Okay. Yeah. The Malabar spinach was inspired by John because at John's garden, he introduced me to the hyacinth moonbeam. And the colours were very similar to the Malabar spinach. It was like purplish, whitish. I liked the way he used it, and like the overflowing effect. That inspired me to use it in Michelle's garden. Okay, now I can really feel the Clementi forest in here. Last but not least, uh, I learned a little bit about air plants. Mm. And they are super oh, low maintenance, okay. super easy to grow. Okay. So I thought maybe it might be nice to... The higher up I went in the planter, the more easy to maintain plants I chose because it's harder to reach, harder to access. So having an air plant there, for example, is a very good option because you can just miss from the bottom and you don't have to miss very often as well. Nice. I really like, like how we have so many varieties. Of course, we have the hardier ones, but like the air plant is, is my first and then this edible is actually, this vine would be my first like real edible plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really thankful for this like whole setup. It's, it's perfect. I love the structure actually. I really love the structure. That's awesome. When I first started out, I, I was really not a fan of houseplants. I just didn't connect with it uh, at all. But throughout this journey, I've actually gained a huge appreciation for houseplants. So now when I look at plants, they don't just look at, like food to me. So it totally look different already, you see? Yes. Yeah. And different people help me to see different kinds of houseplants. So from the air plants to plants in pots to plants in a forest. Slowly but surely, that awareness gave me a sort of a lens, a new lens that I could see and appreciate all these houseplants. I think that's the biggest uh, takeaway that I have. The best part of farming is enjoying the fruits of our labour. Or so I thought. Next week, I meet communities of growers who will show me that the real harvest lies not in the food on the table, but in the friendships forged through the sharing of toil and spoil.